Can a war on drugs ever be won? Tonight, how a president, his police force and hitmen for hire launched a bloody crackdown. But did it work? We report from the slums of Manila, where in the alleys there are claims of police paying the poor and vulnerable to do their dirty work. The prisons are full and thousands have been killed across the Philippines. Now an international court is exploring possible crimes against humanity. Plus, how drugs violence has sent Ecuador into a state of emergency and shockwaves across Latin America. This evening, we'll look at who's driving the demand and ask if the West should do more to help. Also ahead live, the former death row inmate outraged by prison authorities in Alabama. It's over the controversial and untested method of using nitrogen gas to execute a prisoner happening tonight. And the actor Coleman Domingo on the shock of discovering his nomination for Best Actor at this year's Oscars. That's all coming up on The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Good evening. I want to start tonight by talking about the war on drugs. The phrase has been around for decades, but now back in the headlines. Drugs-related violence is gripping countries around the world. In Ecuador, gangs are storming TV stations and killing those who dare to investigate their crimes. A state of emergency is underway as the country's president launches a crackdown. But how do you win a war on drugs? And should there be consequences for how you wage that war? Well, that brings me to the Philippines and its former president. Rodrigo Duterte's crackdown on gangs was brutal, earning him the nickname The Punisher. It also grabbed the attention of the International Criminal Court. They're now investigating possible crimes against humanity. We understand they could issue an arrest warrant for Duterte within six months. Well, since he took power in 2016, more than 12,000 Filipinos are thought to have been killed. At least 2,500 were carried out by the national police, with Duterte and others accused of instigating and inciting the killings. Now, he might be out of power, but the bloodshed goes on. Begging the question, can a war on drugs actually be won? More on that in a moment. First, our Asia correspondent Cordelia Lynch reports from the capital Manila and a warning, her report does contain images of skeletal remains. The shores of Manila, the site of a bloody campaign. These slums, once gripped by fear and death, where thousands were killed. The former president, Rodrigo Duterte, called it a war on drugs. Here they call it a war on the poor. At the height of Duterte's crackdown, the bodies on the streets piled up, killed by vigilantes and police. There is far less bloodshed now, but it hasn't gone away. It's just harder to see. Hey, my friend. Hey, yo. Violence was part of daily life here, and the streets still talk. In the shadows, we meet a hitman. It may be quieter these days, but he claims corrupt police still want guns for hire. Who's asking you to kill? The police give me an envelope with the money and the photo of the subject. I'll get between 20 and 30,000 pesos per head. Are you saying that the police are requesting direct hits on people? Yes. The police will give me the orders and after I kill the target, I throw the gun away. I shoot them three times in the head because if the target survives, they could identify me. It's been called a war on the poor. Do you have any kind of guilt about what you're doing? I've got a lot of kids and I always have to scavenge just to feed and support my family. I want to stop killing but I'm given the direct order and if I don't complete the job, I'll be killed. How many people do you think you've killed? Fourteen. He says this is his other job, scavenging. He makes less than four pounds a day, sifting through rubbish. Killing, he says, gets him up to 400. We can't independently verify his claims, and the police did not respond to our request for comment. They have, though, denied any wrongdoing in the drugs war, a conflict 
that's left its mark here. You know, when I say I shoot them dead, I'd prefer to shoot them in the heart or in the head as at the end of the problem. Duterte's era was marked by alleged extrajudicial killings of suspected drug dealers and users. He denies ordering them and claims the police acted in self-defense. Now Sky News can reveal investigators from the International Criminal Court have visited the country to probe possible crimes against humanity. We understand an arrest warrant for Duterte could be issued within the next six months. The current Philippine president, though, says he won't lift a finger for the investigation. Saints of God come to their aid, hasten to meet them, angels of the Lord. Father Flavi is part of a hunt for justice. A gunman or gunmen would kill a father while he was even holding his four-year-old daughter. It was so frightening that the killings, such killings would took place amidst children. It was so callous that after the killings, the killers would even feast on the meals that the family left behind. He's been exhuming the bodies of victims whose families can't afford to rent their graves anymore. And it's unearthed unexpected new evidence that could be critical. Are you worried that violence is still an issue? The killings might have abated, it might have reduced, but the killers are still at large. Before cremation, he brings the dead here to be examined. Majority of the cases I see have perimortem gunshot wounds to the head, which is what you would typically say execution style, quote unquote. Dr. Raquel Fortune has inspected 94 bodies and discovered big inconsistencies. I have seen uh, death certificates where uh, a doctor somehow signed it out as a natural death. Pneumonia, sepsis, myocardial infarction, and yet he was really shot. Sara Salis lost two sons, Alman and Dickley, six months apart. Their exhumed remains are now in urns, in the home she shares with nine of their children. She claims her sons were killed unlawfully. Police say they were drug suspects and that Dickley fired first. You buried two sons just six months apart. What impact has that had on your life? Grabby. It's difficult for me. Duterte has no pity. He's not helping the people. If I didn't take care of my grandchildren, they would just end up as scavengers. If their parents were still alive, their children would be able to go to school. Some people say Duterte made the Philippines safer. No, everyone was put in danger. He's an animal. He has no heart, no mind, no soul. He didn't even think about those that would be left behind. The clampdown on drugs brought prisons to breaking point. Mandaluyong Jail built a new facility to prevent overcrowding. Well, this is the legacy of a brutal war on drugs that isn't over yet. Around 80% of the prisoners here have been charged with drug offences. Some say they are simply the innocent victims of a bloody and cruel reign of terror by former President Rodrigo Duterte. His successor promised a more humane approach, launching a rehabilitation program. Here, many say it's helping. Do you think the current president is taking a better approach? Yes, of course. There's a lot of innocent people dying in the uh, administration of Duterte. Even the poor people uh, is getting jailed. In the administration of uh, Marcos, is uh, not, uh, not like uh, Duterte's style. 
To his supporters, he was the strong man, saviour, who tried to stop the Philippines becoming a narco state. Now, he might get help from a government refusing to play ball with the ICC, but it's a court he can't control. Cordelia Lynch, Sky News, Manila, in the Philippines. And powerful reporting there from Cordelia. And as Cordelia mentioned, Sky News understands the ICC could issue an arrest warrant against former President Duterte in the next six months. Let's hear more on the case. Uh, joining me now is Dr. Chile Abu Usuju, uh, former president of the International Criminal Court. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Um, I understand you were the president of the uh, ICC from 2018 to 2021. What more can you tell? Tell us about this case. What you already reported that captures is absolutely. I mean, there was um, the prosecutor was of the ICC was investigating the case uh, when Philippines was a member of the court, and, and precisely because of that investigation or those investigations, rather, the um, president of the Philippines at the time was under investigation himself decided to withdraw the uh, Philippines from the ICC. So that's where, um, that's what your story hasn't so far captured. Yes, that, that and, and I guess, um, you know, we, we want to sort of understand better whether this um, arrest warrant is going to be issued in the next uh, six months. That's, there is a lot of speculation around that. I, I wouldn't know because um, um, even... Um, these are speculations. I wouldn't know where your uh, source is getting that information from. Uh, since I've left the court, I have not been poking my nose into what's happening there. Uh, but, but they, they I, you know, know I, doing, I, yes. I, I, as you said, President Duterte uh, ca came out of, of uh, the ICC, he pulled his country out in 2019 as a result of uh, this probe. The current president um, says he may go back or may not. Um, do you think that will have uh, make a difference, I guess, to this case? Um, it will definitely make a difference, but even as it stands, the case, uh, the investigation uh, can continue. It has continued. And Philippines is so under an obligation to cooperate with the court. I was reading some of the news items where the current president said that he will not cooperate, that it is a violation of the sovereignty of the Philippines. That's not correct. Uh, they have an obligation to cooperate with the ICC because they actually signed that obligation as a treaty uh, when they signed the Rome Statute, I believe, in August 2011. The treaty they signed has a specific provision in it, Article 127, Paragraph 2. They say, even if you withdraw from membership of the Rome Statute, you are still an, uh, under an obligation to cooperate with an investigation that started before your because withdrawal. even the new even the new government say that they will not cooperate. That's what I'm addressing here. That they can say that, but that will not be a lawful position to take. It will be an unlawful position to take. The lawful position is that they have to cooperate because they specifically signed up to that obligation on the uh, in August 2011. So they so have a is, treaty obligation to cooperate with the court. If this arrest warrant is issued and you say they are obliged to cooperate, can it be enforced? It, it can be enforced. It can be enforced um, um, as a matter of, for one thing, uh, people think that, well, if an arrest warrant is issued against me, I will not uh, cooperate, and that's the end of the matter. It's not that simple. Uh, even if you're a head of state, you cannot travel, and um, you'll be looking behind your back all the time. Uh, there may be a change of government that will turn you over, or the government that may be protecting you in the meantime may have a reason uh, in future to change their minds. That happened with President Milosevic 
of uh, the of, uh, Saab, yeah, who for a long time was under an arrest warrant, uh, but then the government at the time refused and then changed their minds and then handed it over to to The Hague. So um, it can be enforced. Yeah, so uh, as you say, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see what happens over the next uh, six months. And the government of uh, the Philippines will be in a position where they may find themselves being asked to, to hand over Rodrigo Duterte. That would be the case indeed. If, if there is an arrest warrant issued, that would be the natural uh, progression of things, yes. Dr. Chile uh, Ebu Osuji, uh, former president of the International Criminal Court, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, in a moment, we'll hear the thoughts of tonight's panel, former Middle East advisor at the Pentagon, Jasmine El Gamal, and associate defence editor uh, for The Telegraph, Dominique Nichols. Uh, but first, the drug crackdown in the Philippines and the ICC investigation. We asked the question, has the so-called war on drugs really worked anywhere? Have a listen. If you want to join me here? Won't you be seated, please, ladies and gentlemen? It's more than 50 years since President Nixon declared what's known as the War on Drugs. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. Half a century on, has this war been lost as the front has pushed global? Right now, Ecuador is in a state of emergency. It started after this man known as Fito disappeared from prison. He's one of Ecuador's most notorious drug lords and then swathes of violence across the country. A public broadcast channel attacked and held at gunpoint. The presenter left pleading, gunshots heard in the background. Ecuador's president still grappling with a drugs trade fueled by neighbors Colombia and Peru that's been forcibly etched into the country's fabric. I've just signed a decree of state of emergency so the armed forces can have all the political and legal support in their actions. Elsewhere, the signs remain unsettling. Xylazine, or Trank, has spread across the US at an alarming speed. Its emergence deepening the country's drug crisis. Its impacts devastating. Across the border to the south, in Mexico, it's fentanyl. Its production toxic, but its illegal trade thriving. In the Middle East, Syria now seen as a narco state. Captagon, an amphetamine, is claimed to be its biggest export. But should any of these countries be left to deal with it alone? Here in the West, there's no shortage of customers. A study found the UK has the second highest rate of cocaine use in the world. In third and fourth, Austria and Spain. If the war on drugs is now a global war, then could we do more to help? Well, uh, let's speak now to Jasmine and Dominic, who join me here in the studio. I mean, Jasmine, we can see, you know, the, the deep connections between money, drugs, crime, politics, geopolitics. It's all deeply interconnected. Absolutely. And you can see it in Syria. You know, you can see it in the Middle East and the Captagon trade coming out of Syria, the way it's combining... Uh, the survival of the Assad regime, the money coming in that's allowing that state to survive and the, the regime, its cronies, uh, its friends, its allies, despite all the sanctions on it. You can see it in the way that it conducts its diplomacy. There's a term about it called narco diplomacy now, um, which basically means that the state is using this as a lever um, when they're talking to other countries, um, when the Middle East, when the Arab League was talking about normalizing relations with Bashar al-Assad, they had a long list of things that they wanted the Assad regime to do before starting normalization talks, like talking about detainees and missing persons in Syria and the refugee return issue. None of those things actually budged. There was no progress made on them, but they ended up normalizing anyway. And one of the issues on the table was... Captagon, because so much of it is going into the neighboring countries, going to partiers in Saudi Arabia and Dubai, going into Jordan, going from Jordan to other places. And so Bashar al-Assad was able to use that as a chip. So it really goes much broader than just the use of the drug 
in that country that it's in or even recreationally. Yeah, I mean, Dominique, you know, we can see how authoritarian regimes or states that become pariah states facing sanctions suddenly find themselves having to work very closely with criminal elements and gangs and the drugs trade. Well, absolutely, and it's almost the wrong concept to think of these things, these entities as as gangs, they are much bigger than that. It's not, I mean, it's bigger than business. These are huge transnational, international conglomerates and they might be dealing um, drugs. If they're dealing drugs, they might be dealing in cocaine, which are, today is $28,000 a kilo in the US, 40,000 in Europe. I mean, huge, huge money here. And if it's not cocaine, then they'll move on to ketamine or tranquil or anything else, wherever, wherever the heat is not. And if it's on drugs, then they'll move to people trafficking or weapons smuggling or what have you. These, these entities are so fluid and so uh, agile, much, much faster than the state within the, which they're operating and usually the international setting and the, the network of alliances and, uh, and sort of global uh, groups that come together to try and stump them out. I mean, they are, uh, in many ways, because they're behold the bureaucracy and in many cases the, the democratic process much slower than these than these okay gangs are, are, are able to 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 shift their shift their um, their activities across across um, international lines across uh, whole different areas of the world so I mean it's very very difficult to try and nail them down in the first place let alone deal with that problem once you've contained it. And that's the point. How do you nail it down? I mean as you say it was part of the normalization talks but nothing has necessarily changed. That's right. And it's a matter of this question of when you think that the state that is supposed to be tackling the problem actually benefits from the problem. And the same goes for neighbors and partners. So, for example, Syria decided or agreed to join a subcommittee that includes countries like Jordan, Lebanon and Iraq to, quote unquote, tackle the problem of Captagon. But you have Hezbollah in Lebanon that benefits from that trade. You have Iranian-backed militias again, in Iraq. Again, we're dealing with very fragile states. Exactly. And so, just like you said, Dominic, you don't have these, you don't have the bureaucracy, you don't have the infrastructure. Sometimes, you know, a lot of experts are saying that the UK and the US are far behind where they should be when it comes to supporting the region in dealing with these issues and dealing with these weaknesses. Um, Maybe because it hasn't hit the UK in great waves yet. Maybe it's something that they're not thinking about yet. But it is a public health issue, whether it's just in the Middle East, whether it's about to come over to Europe or or uh, elsewhere. It's a public health issue that in, that requires the involvement of not just the region, but, but partners the wider, of the region uh, that support it as well. And the wider international community. Absolutely. Jasmine, Dominic, will keep you here because uh, do stay with us. Uh, coming up, a story so controversial, it's brought the whole US legal system under the spotlight. This man, who's already survived a lethal ejection, will be executed in Alabama by being forced to breathe in nitrogen. I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. When you think of Glastonbury, it's mud you want and music. They're going to cross to us live. Okay. We always were capable of doing this. Oh, they're wonderful children as an audience. Who did that? A maverick here on the red carpet. I'm so excited. Hello. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. Nor have I ever struck any woman in my life. There's this illusion of power. Are you feeling well? I remember covering the Oscars and that now infamous moment, the Will Smith slap. You can tell from these crowds just how excited people are for the return of Clyde. These actors playing the lead roles were born long after the Sex Pistols broke up. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world. OK, I'll talk to you. Don't leave me. Yeah, OK. <laughs> There's no easy goodies. There's no easy baddies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.
Welcome back. We're heading to the United States now, where tonight the state of Alabama will try and put an inmate to death using nitrogen gas. The state claims the killing of 58-year-old Kenneth Eugene Smith will be humane. But the method is untested. In fact, it's the first attempt to use a new execution method since the 1982 introduction of lethal injection. Six years on death row in Alabama before his conviction was eventually overturned. He's on his way to the prison to protest against tonight's killing. Thank you so much, Gary, for joining us here uh, uh, on uh, the program. I mean, you know all too well uh, what uh, is going on with uh, Kenneth and what he may be feeling tonight. You were on death row yourself. You're now on your way to, to the prison in support of Kenneth. Yes, I am. Uh... Kenneth was a very good friend, and I know exactly the torture that he's going through now. I mean, he's been going through this torture for the last year since they tried to kill him last year. Yes, there was one other attempt, as you say, about a year ago, and that failed. It did. They, they couldn't get a vein in his his arm, so they they kept him on the gurney for a little over four hours trying to get a vein sticking him time after time after time. And he sell, said he felt every one of them has had nightmares ever since then. And this time around, I mean, it just sounds absolutely horrific the way that you're describing it. This time around, he's being asked to breathe nitrogen gas. He is. And they said even if he vomit and was choking on his vomit, they was going to let it go. They was going to let him go ahead and die no matter what. And uh, I mean, as you, as we said earlier in our introduction, you yourself, you were on on death row um, for six years. Yes, al almost six years. I was falsely convicted of a robbery murder. I was finally able to get some decent attorneys when I won my appeal, and they were able to prove that I was home the night of the murder. Did you ever lose hope? I really did. I, I mean. When you can't get anybody to listen to you, you, you lose hope quick. Uh, and this this um, nitrogen gas, the use of it, is untested. And although the courts say uh, that it will be humane, it, it's, it's hard to know, uh, you know, because it is untested. You also now spend a lot of time working with others who are on death row, campaigning for them. You've made this your life's mission. I have. I'm a member of Witness to Innocence to Abolish the Death Penalty. We're a group of uh, exonerated death row prisoners and our family members. We go all over the country speaking so, out against the death penalty. And and so you're going there. You say that Kenneth is a friend. You know, you're going there to be with him in solidarity? Yes, ma'am. He was and a I very guess, good friend. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Just uh, You must have been working with him and talking to him a lot over the past, especially, I guess, the last year and what he's been through. Well, I actually haven't got to talk to him. I've got to talk to other friends that talk to him. I mean, Kenneth's been going through a lot. It, that really messed his mind up. He, he's been going through so much torture for the last year. He, he tries to stay strong for his wife and his mother. But it's hard to do. I, I mean, Kenneth was, when I got in there, Kenneth was there. And he was a born-again Christian. Uh, he always had a big smile on his face. He would help anybody that he could. He would never harm anybody again. People change. Gary, uh, we're really grateful for your time. Thank you so much uh, for talking to us as you make your way there to the prison in Alabama. That was Gary Drinkard talking to us live there. He spent six years on death row himself uh, until uh, he was exonerated. Um, Jasmine, uh, Dominic, you're here with me. I mean, it's just sort of quite difficult to listen to all of that and the fact that there was one attempt already that failed. It really is. I mean, when you just hear about the torture that he's been going through and the attempt last year and you just the thing that keeps going through your mind is what if they don't get it right? I mean, you're t literally talking now to someone who was falsely convicted for years and there's just no room for error when it comes to this kinds of stuff It, it just really um, it's tough to hear something like that. Yeah, I think that 
that piece there with Mr. Drinkard, I mean, that, that brings it home that he was there for six years under the, the threat of this, and then he had his... He, he was exonerated, and yet, you know, he could have been killed by the, by the, by the government, by the state. And I just think that the chances of getting it wrong once is enough to say that it's, it's, it's a system that is inherently flawed. I don't think it's a good idea to say to, to people that, that we're going we're to show you that it's wrong to kill people by killing people. I just don't agree with, with capital punishment. I don't think this is the right thing to do. I think the case you just heard can show exactly how, how, how big the downside can be and how close it is every time. Dominique, Jasmine, are we going to keep you both there? Because coming up, uh, will the International Court of Justice rule that Israel must stop its offensive in Gaza? South Africa's genocide case is being heard at The Hague tomorrow. We'll explore the long history between uh, the South African and Palestinian people. Welcome back. Still with me, tonight's panel, former Middle East advisor at the Pentagon, Jasmine El Gamal, and associate defense editor for The Telegraph, Dominique Nichols. We'll hear from them in a moment. 
But first, just over two weeks ago, South African prosecutors told an international court that Israel was carrying out genocide against the Palestinian people in Gaza. Tomorrow, judges at The Hague will decide whether to grant emergency measures that could halt Israel's military offensive. So you may be wondering why South Africa brought the case. Our Africa correspondent, Yusra El Bagir, can explain more. South Africa is not alone in drawing attention to Israel's genocidal rhetoric against Palestinians in Gaza. But South Africa is leading the charge. The country launched a genocide case against Israel at the International Court of Justice and called for interim measures to be upheld by the court, including a ceasefire and increased humanitarian aid to Gaza. The court is not required to determine that the only inference to be drawn from the available evidence is genocidal to order provisional measures. A judgment on these measures is expected shortly, but celebrations started on Palestinian soil as soon as their case had been argued at The Hague, at the feet of the Nelson Mandela statue in Ramallah. Thank you to South Africa. Uh, we believe that many countries fe felt our pain, but South Africa decided to put it materially in paper, on paper, and file a case. And here in South Africa, under the gaze of its founding father, the solidarity runs deep. South African liberation has long been linked to Palestinian resistance, spearheaded by Nelson Mandela. And even after the end of South African apartheid in 1994, he's famously quoted as saying, our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. There's no freedom that will be complete in the world without the freedom of other people. We are a, a connected humanity. Anti-apartheid veteran Reverend Frank Chikani has just come back from the West Bank and says he saw stark parallels with apartheid South Africa. So it has been perfected. It's on the basis of racial discrimination. The laws are graded. Uh, if you are a Palestinian, Arab, Israeli, your rights go this far and not further. Whatever the legal outcome, many South Africans will keep marching for Palestine, as they've done in recent months, but also for decades. Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! To be outraged at the inhumanity of the genocide being perpetrated on the Palestinians in Gaza. What is happening in Palestine right now is it's, it's worse than what happened in South, in South Africa. You know, we didn't have a complete annihilation of families. Outrage has given way to cautious anticipation with the ruling imminent. Whatever the ruling is and whatever uh, Israel decides to do with that, because, you know, powerful actors very rarely comply with uh, legal rulings, but... Um, it is a remarkable moment in, in thinking about this, you know, South Africa's really pushed the law to its limits. Whichever way the court rules South Africa versus Israel will go down as a landmark case. Win or lose, a precedent has been set. Yusuf al Sky News, Johannesburg. Okay, let's speak with our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, who joins us from The Hague ahead of tomorrow's ruling. Um, and uh, Dom, what are the Israelis saying? Yeah, and that's the kind of South African case, isn't it? But from the Israeli point of view, it has to be said, said that they reject vehemently these allegations against them. And many Israelis are deeply offended and wounded that uh, this case has been brought uh, against them, being charged with uh, a genocide uh, f for a country that has been founded in the wake of the worst genocide in, in history. And many Israelis believe that October the 7th itself was a genocidal act carried out by an organisation that is hell-bent and sworn to the genocidal destruction of the Jewish state. So they reject that. And in the court, uh, they had various ways of pushing back against the South African uh, claims. They say they're acting in self-defence against Hamas. They're not trying to kill all Palestinians because they're Palestinians. They're simply trying to eradicate the threat posed by Hamas. They say they've carried out and, and are still carrying out various measures to try and protect civilians, which they wouldn't be doing if they were acting genocidally. And they've also pushed back against South Africa's strongest attack 
possibly, which was the claims that a number of Israeli senior officials were making genocidal uh, incitements, uh, saying that that was just rhetoric. It was rhetoric uttered in moments of anguish uh, and trauma. They also say the South Africans were politically motivated in bringing this case because of their close ties with Palestinians uh, and with Hamas. The problem for the Israelis, though, is if the court does rule against them in this provisional ruling tomorrow, they can't really say the court itself is politically motivated. It is a very highly regarded institution of the UN's judicial uh, organisation and they will have to accept whatever provisional ruling is handed down to them, uh, at least uh, for the time being. Dom, um, just briefly, is there a sense of where this might go? Well, the South Africans have asked the court to do th two things. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, and, and over th this will take a number of years, establish whether genocide is being committed and a final ruling. But they've also asked for a provisional action to be taken by the court. And all, all they need for that is to establish that there is a plausible case that genocide uh, is being committed. And a number of legal scholars think they possibly have met that bar, particularly because of these uh, incitements, uh, these, these, these words uttered by Israeli uh, officials. Um, if the provisional ruling does go against them, then the court can order a ceasefire in Gaza and Hamas tonight have said they will comply with a ceasefire as well, even though they're not bound by the rulings uh, of the court. They could fall short of that. The judges, they could say they want to have other mitigating circumstances and uh, rulings imposed, for instance, more humanitarian aid to be sent into the Palestinians of Gaza. It's impossible to say where it goes from here. But if a ruling is given against Israel and they do not comply, then the UN Security Council could take punitive action against them. Unless, of course, America, their ally, exercises its veto in the Security Council. Tom, uh, thanks so much uh, for that update uh, from The Hague. Let's speak to our panellists about this. And um, Jasmine, uh, as, as Dom said there, I mean, Israel categorically denies these accusations. This is not just about the case for genocide, because that could take years. This is right. about provisional measures. Right. I mean, it's hard to overstate how huge tomorrow is. I mean, this is just, it's such a landmark decision. It's such a historic event that's happening. And like, like Dom said, this is a state uh, accused of genocide that was founded in the wake of a horrific genocide. I mean, it's, the, the implications are just huge. And the Israelis, of course, are pushing back against it, saying, well, the intent that you're saying, we, have, we had intent to uh, displace and you know, Palestinians. As much it's as about intent. Intent is really important. And a lot of the, the bulk of the case when it comes to intent is verbatim what Israeli officials has been, had been saying. Just today, I think it was either today or yesterday, a cabinet minister said for the second time in a few weeks that uh, that Gaza, that a nuclear bomb basically should lay waste to Gaza. As this is happening, and he even said, the Hague knows my position on this. And so when they say, when Israelis say, or when the government says, words don't matter, these were just words, we didn't mean them. You have to go back to when the Iranian president, Ahmadinejad, said we want to wipe Israel off the map. Israel certainly wasn't saying at the time that these were just words. Words matter. Intentions matter. And we can't just sit around and have these words being stated and give people the benefit of the doubt when it's across the board uh, and just say, oh, well, they don't mean it. But that's just words. That's besides what's actually happening on the ground. Um, and we can go more into this, but what's happening on the ground is is horrific, obviously, and certainly not anything akin to simple self-defense. Well, let's let's bring in uh, Dominic on what's happening on the ground. We're now about 110 days or more into this conflict. 25,000 Palestinians dead, almost 300 uh, Israeli soldiers killed. We saw the funeral of of 24 killed in in one uh, incident. 130 hostages kept. I mean, when we, we've been talking a lot this week about, you know, how do you measure success in, in war? I guess, you know, how do you measure success in this particular conflict? Well, I mean, it's very, very difficult, partly because Israel have, have picked two objectives here. They want to free the hostages, and as you say, number now 130, and you, you obviously can put a number on that because they know how many people there are, and so they can say, well, when they're all back, that's, that's success. Um, but they've also said they want to eradicate Hamas. So how do you measure that? It's, it's, it's an idea as well as a movement. So they've got a really, really tough problem there. And because they've picked these two very, very difficult problems, one of which 
against Hamas. They are, they are trying to prosecute it by using extreme violence, but they are also trying to negotiate to get the, the hostages back. You saw this latest, uh, latest idea that was sort of floated to see if there was a, an idea that a two-month ceasefire might, might lead to some form of uh, negotiation there. It, nothing's come of that so far. But, but they've got these two, the, these two strategies, two different objectives, and neither of them really work together and they haven't got the resources to, to do both at the same time and they, they were called for two completely different strategies and so they are, Israel are really up against it now, they've, they've gone into this, admittedly they said it was a very clear end state what they wanted to achieve but, but actually the more you unpick that it's very very difficult and, to get there. And then just very briefly growing international pressure like this ruling potentially. Right. I mean, the, the ruling is significant not just because of what it might say tomorrow. I mean, it's significant because it's really going to lay bare what international law really means. Does international law actually apply to everyone or does it only apply to a few people? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to all of that. We're, unfortunately, we're, we have to go to an ad break, but we will continue the conversations next up. <laughs> Something completely different, actually. I mean, we've talked about so many um, heavy issues this evening, but I'll be hearing from the man of the moment in Hollywood, Coleman Domingo. We'll be chatting about how he found uh, he was nominated for an Oscar and being black and gay in the entertainment industry. Honest, when I started, it wasn't really about any particular angle. It was just this really cool new thing to do. I was obviously a big Usain Bolt fan at the time. So there was a part of all feeling like, oh, I'm a sprinter just like him. Yeah. I mean, you have to thank God for great people around you. My really good friend, Ben, I mean, I was quick at school and that kind of thing. And he was like, look, you've never given this thing a go. What are you, what are you waiting for? Give it a go. And, and that was literally how I got into it. Yeah. And here you are, you run um, sub 10 seconds yes, ma'am. in this event. Uh, you reached the semi-finals of the World Championships. As I said, ranked fourth on the British 100 metres all-time list with 9.93. To qualify for the Olympics, what have you got to do? Because looking at that, you're within touching distance. Amen. Um, yes, yeah, so you've got to run qualifying times 10 flat. You know, the small matter of going to yeah. our national championships Smash and coming... that, yeah. <laughs> small matter of going to the national championships and coming in the top two, top three. Um, and then, yeah, job done. Sealed. <laughs> I had to work full time because, you know, you've got bills, life, mortgage, yeah. nursery payments. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in a situation now where I can see my coach a little bit more. Um, but look, I don't, people may look at it and think, isn't that distraction? How on earth can he balance the two things? I very much look at it as a competitive advantage in the sense that, look, I'm I also feel like I'm flying the flag for civilians, normal people working a nine to five, yeah. letting them know that, look, it's all possible, you know what I mean? You have a little bit of faith, a little bit of belief. Yeah. Um, whatever hidden talents that you're sitting on, you know what I mean? Whip it back out and go, and go after it. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. That's what I'm flying the flag for. You know what it is? It's going to sound massively cliche, but you just take that first step. Yeah. And then the next one will take care of itself. And then the next one, and the next one. And then before you know it, you're tearing down the athletics track by the sub 10 <laughs> seconds and 100 metres. You know, but no, it's honestly as simple as that. You'll never know if you never try. I think it would be, it's like a dream beyond a dream. It'd be mega. I often joke that I'll get the Olympic rings tattooed on my forehead. <laughs> and that'd probably be the end of my corporate career. Um, just because it'd be that kind of, but yeah, I think it would be a great sort of impactful, inspirational kind of story. I'm not a gatekeeper of any sort. So I just love to share and hope that it will catch someone in by someone, but no, it would be mega. So God willing, we can make that happen. I'm Mark Stone and I'm Sky's US correspondent. Is this the moment to reform gun laws? We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. I'm playing devil's advocate. Mark Stone, Sky News in the United States.
Welcome back. He's the star of the new biopic, Rustin, playing civil rights leader Bayard Rustin. And as of this week, he's also an Oscar nominee. Coleman... Your facts are correct. The sense of history is not. Those 42,000 men marched on Washington, D.C. because it was the Depression. Coleman Domingo is only the second gay man to be nominated for playing a gay role in film. I spoke to him earlier and asked where he was when he heard the good news. I was actually in my bathroom. <laughs> I was in my bathroom and my phone dinged and it was my manager texting me that I was an Oscar nominee and I literally just put the phone down because the feed was coming in later and my husband was watching it. And so then I then maybe six seconds later, I hear my name and watch my husband fall, lay down on the floor in tears. And I was still just in shock. So then I looked at him and I think I realized how I should react. So then I started crying as well. And then, <laughs> then, then I gathered him up and we jumped up and down. And then the beautiful day of mayhem of flowers and phone calls and everything started pouring in. We're going to put together the largest peaceful protest in the history of this nation. How big? 100,000 people. I guess the question is, what did it teach you about yourself? Oh, wow. It taught me many things. It taught me to sort of like, there's a tagline that we use for Rustin, which is to own your power. And that's for everyone, to own your power, own your voice, own your space. Because that was something that he was doing in 1963, especially when he had everything against him, saying that he should not exist, that he should not have a voice. And so to watch someone who was completely undaunted. On August 28th, black, white, young, old, rich, working class, poor, will descend on Washington, D.C. At a time when they, they didn't want him to exist in many ways. And he made spaces for himself. And he knew that he had intelligence and a spirit of uh, looking after others and making this country a better place, making the world a better place. He wanted to destroy. There's all of us coming together and demanding this country change. Let's talk a little bit about representation. I mean, there's been so much chatter around these nominations uh, about who hasn't been nominated, but actually there have been a, a lot of firsts. I mean, you as an yeah. Afro-Latina uh, uh, actor, someone who's, uh, again, openly gay, and we also had um, Lily Gladstone, the first Native uh, American woman. There are a lot of firsts here as well. I think that we it's important to focus on the firsts and the diversity of these nominations and not the lack of because of whatever reasons because i think that you know you know there was there was a, a call because oscars was so white years ago and i feel like we it, I, i'm part of the academy and i know that we've been making sure that there's put more inclusion and diversity and really making strides so i think that it's very important that we we honor those and we look at all these first and hopefully they will not be the last but it's just showing that people are watching more films that seemingly may not have anything to do with them, but they understand that they are about them. That's what my director, George C. Wolf said. He said, we've got to get to the place, not only in cinema, but also in the world, where we understand that it doesn't have to look like you to be about you. It's a wonderful way to, to uh, end. Coleman, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What a wonderful thought uh, to, to end on. There have been some fantastic movies that have, that have come out uh, at the moment. I'm sure you both got in get, uh, involved in Barbenheimer. Only half of it for me, <laughs> Bar Barbie. Oh, uh, really? Which I, I did like. I, like. I like Barbie. I love the pastiche at the beginning. No plot spoilers, but the 2001 pastiche at the start I thought it was terrific. Um, I like the movie, all very pink, sort of being assaulted by pink stuff, and then the brilliant Billie Eilish song at the end. Yeah. I liked it. I haven't seen Oppenheimer. We did, my husband and I did Barbenheimer with our friends. It was a lot. I don't know if we would do it again if we had to do it, <laughs> but I think we did it in the right order. We did Barbie and then Oppenheimer. I think it would have been really weird to do it the other way around. Yeah. Um, but I love the, the interview that you showed right now, honestly. I love the way that he talked about how he was portraying uh, Rustin and how he said that it was really fitting that he was coming into the spotlight yeah. as he was shining a spotlight on, on him. him. And, and how and, and sort of carrying that legacy, carrying but also about that himself. Legacy. Yeah, yeah. Well, said, I've it was great. thoroughly enjoyed work, uh, talking to you both, Jasmine and uh, Dominic. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. Well, remember the name, Carmen Domingo. Can he cause an upset at the Academy Awards in March? That's it from me and the team. The news at ten is next.